little bit of history of the Security and Prosperity Partnership for North America, the SPP. I want it to be on your, in your lexicon, in your vocabulary. This is something that had a confluence of interests uh, that came together to create this after 9-11. The first was, one was in the United States, where security now trumped trade, it trumped economic issues altogether, and there was a strong uh, desire by the Bush administration to impose the war on terror and the homeland security provisions and measures on all of North America, because of course it shared this northern and southern border with these other two countries, and the feeling was that they could not be secure unless the two bordering nations were secure. So it meant um, ziplocking, as one politician called it, ziplocking North America in, in this new draconian security zone, where there would be very little difference in the approach to security, and now America's enemies would become enemies of Canada and, the, and uh, Mexico as well. And our policies in Canada and Mexico would have to converge and harmonize in order to make this happen. And this also meant uh, a thick, what they call a thickening of the border. And uh, it was very clear that the United States said to both Canada and Mexico, your NAFTA relationship gives you no special privilege under this new situation. The rules of NAFTA are gone. The new rules are if we don't feel it's safe for you or any good or whatever to be going across that border, it will not be coming across the border. So Canada and Mexico, in a way, lost their favored status with the United States that they had under NAFTA. So that was the first pressure. The other pressure that came simultaneously after 9-11 came from the big business community in Canada, the same folks that originally started us off on the Canada-US free trade ago, uh, free agree agreement that many years ago. In fact, the same man, a guy named Tom DeKino, um, and Tom DeKino, they changed their name from the Business Council on National Issues, because they no longer care about national issues, to the Canadian Council of Chief Executives. But it's the same 150 big corporations, and they were very worried about this thickening of the board order post 9-11. So Tom DeKino bought a bunch of corporate CEOs from Canada down to meet with corporate CEOs in the US and also to meet with key White House personnel and was told if you want to try to keep that border you know, somewhat open for, for prosperity, you've got to give us the security agenda in, in, in exchange. And so they came up with a blueprint called the Security and Prosperity Initiative for North America that was written by the big business community in Canada. And they turned and they convinced our government, the government of our, in, our gov in our country, to, exchange, uh, to offer to exchange huge amounts of sovereignty in areas of security, military, trade, and resources in order to maintain the special status that they had with the United States in terms of trade. So the idea was to link security and prosperity together. If you want prosperity, you have to guarantee to the Bush administration the level of security it is requiring. Uh, and uh, didn't stop the border from thickening, by the way, but this was the argument. Uh, the big advantage to the big business community in Canada and the United States and, and, and soon after in, in uh, Mexico was access, uh, was harmonization of regulations. This is what they always wanted post-NAFTA. They never saw NAFTA as being the last step in this process, only one more step in a process to create a harmonized uh, system. They don't want to bump into higher standards, be it environmental or health or safety or food standards, as they go across borders. So this was a terrific opportunity. I consider it to be an opportunistic and cold move on the part of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives that they jumped in and used this crisis to further uh, an agenda that they wanted. And of course, they got great uh, support from the business community of North America. So at very first, when this project started to be talked about, they had a lot of grand language, great big statements about how exciting this was, and it was a big vision. They were talking about North American Union, a common market, a common passport, common defense, common security systems, and common resource pooling. Now, the grand vision has largely receded, and now if you talk to the powers that be, they'll say, oh, the SPP is not really alive in the way that it was. They quickly moved from that because it became very contentious, particularly in our country. Uh, it became then much more of a handshake deal, and in Waco, Texas, in March of 2005, then president of Mexico, Vincente Fox, 
George Bush and then Prime Minister of Canada, Paul Martin, signed the Security and Prosperity Partnership for North America. So it morphed from the Security and Part Pro Prosperity Initiative of the Canadian Council of Chief Executives to this handshake, which is basically an executive agreement to fundamentally implement this project. And it never went to the legislatures of the three countries. And I am going to pose to you here that this is as far-reaching an agreement and perhaps more so than NAFTA. It has had very little debate. It has had no public scrutiny because hardly anybody knows about it. I said to him, why did the Security and Prosperity Partnership for North America not go to the three legislatures of the three countries for ratification and debate? And he said, and I quote, because the three countries and their business communities did not want another bruising NAFTA battle. They figured that we would lose. So those of us who've read it, that this thing is really a far-reaching uh, agreement that is going to have profound effects in North America, a kind of European Union, but without any of the safeguards that were originally built into the European Union around human rights or around uh, you know, resource sharing or around environmental considerations. And of course, Europe is also going through its own struggle about uh, um, a, um, you know, whether it's a neoliberal agenda or not, but at least it started out as something profoundly different. The next year they met in Mexico and they created the North American Competitiveness Council, which is the 30 major corporations uh, in North America, including Lockheed Martin and Walmart, Chevron, and so on. And these corporations are advising these governments in this smart regulation process. And uh, they, are the only or they are the only group that is being listened to at any level, in any way, shape, or form by the heads of state. Now, and then they met this past August in Montebello, uh, Quebec. There are four areas that we need to examine in, de in depth with this. The first is the security harmonization. And these, uh, this is not just an issue in Canada and Mexico, and here I'm speaking to Americans mostly, where people on a no-fly list in one country are now on the no-fly list in all countries. And if you now get arrested for peaceful dissent in your country, you will not be able to move to the other countries uh, of the security and prosperity uh, partnership block. Uh, and this is, means that it's a very, very different kind of thing now to get arrested. There are many facets of this security agenda. I can only touch on that. Secondly, there are there are there are now there are now 20 working groups working it, there are, from the bureaucracies of the three countries working to converge every level of regulation and standards from food and seeds to the environment to health and safety. It's called smart regulations. And we already know, in one case, it was just leaked to us that Canada has lowered some pesticide standards uh, on food, pesticide residues on food. Number three is resource exploitation, that there's a five-fold increase in the tar sands, the destructive, terrible northern uh, oil extraction that's taking place in northern Alberta. This is a terrible model for the continent. It's not just Canadians who should be concerned about this, and certainly Mexicans who said no to uh, opening up their, their control of their own energy in NAFTA are going to be urged under the Security and Prosperity Partnership to do this now. But this is not just an issue for Canada and Mexico. This is an issue for any of us working on climate change, on renewable energies, on a more sustainable future for our country, our continent, and our world. And finally, uh, it's based on labor flexibility. Some of the business community involved in this are extremely clear. The end result or the end goal of this is to create a competitive North America able to compete with Europe and more particularly China. And to do that, they need to destroy unions and they need to bring down those wage and labor standards to the lowest common standards of the block. This is, this is the transportation route that will be hydroelectricity, energy, water, rail, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, um, media, all of, all of this to create this, um, this, this new reality. We need to do some work together. We need to understand that we have a problem here and that there isn't a treaty that we can pull out like the multilateral agreement on investment 
or NAFTA. We don't have the piece, one piece of paper. We have many pieces of paper, and what it comes together to create is a North American fortress based on the very worst values of NAFTA, based on the worst values of neoliberalism, based on everything we've been fighting for here today and, and yesterday. And if we don't come together to defeat this, we will not only not be able to undo the worst parts of NAFTA, we will be cementing the worst parts of NAFTA into something worse. Montebello, Quebec, where the three leaders came together, uh, but we were, I was standing in a coffee shop, and uh, one of the police came in pretty exhausted, and took, it was a hot day, and he took off his, his, his uh, riot gear, and he took, had a cup of coffee, and the woman serving him said, what are all these protesters doing here? He said, well, the Prime Minister of Canada and the Presidents of the United States and Mexico are meeting to discuss the future of North America. But he said, they're only talking to the big corporations, and he said, these people don't think that's a good idea. And he paused and he said, neither do I.